basement of the Senate. And the state hopes to leave behind a federal program. Details in Capitol Report. Hello, everybody, and thanks for tuning in. I'm Julie Bartke. Governor Mark Dayton recently announced the names of 22 members of the newly established Early Learning Council. They are tasked with advising lawmakers on the best way to access state and federal early childhood programs and dollars. I just left uh, about 1,200 very dedicated Minnesotans as uh, part of the Reading Corps, and their commitment is to help the uh, children throughout Minnesota's elementary schools uh, be able to read by th the end of third grade. But learning to read by the end of third grade really starts at three years and, and really even three months. And that's what this uh, council will be charged with doing, developing the best ways in which Minnesota can make it possible for every child, every child, to be able to read successfully so that they're then ready to learn and have the confidence necessary to be successful for the rest of their lives. We want to be able to work with professional development of early childhood providers as well as work on the rating system so that we can ensure quality. So when parents have to make these tough, difficult choices about where to send their children, they have some information on how to do that that will help them know and be assured that they'll be ready for kindergarten. Here to discuss a little bit about the early childhood education quality rating system and a more broad policy discussion on K-12 education, we have Senator Dave Thompson. Thanks for joining us today. My pleasure. Thanks for having me. Let's begin with the governor's decision on August 10th to, to actually opt into that early childhood education quality rating system. It's a program that was not funded by the legislature last session, and it is necessary for the next round of Race to the Stop applications. So it's fair to say it was one of the more divisive ideological battles of the session. Why are you not in favor of it? Well, first off, just procedurally, the governor shouldn't be adopting programs that the legislature heard but chose not to fund. To me, that's, that's wrong, and, and constitutionally that shouldn't be done. But secondly, I'm not a big believer in the expansion of early childhood education because I believe that education up to age five should be the responsibility of parents, and uh, we should not turn our children loose in the in the education system, whether public or, or private private paid for by the state until uh, that child reaches age of kindergarten and I don't know why we continue to hand more and more responsibility to the government rather than having parents do their jobs, teach kids to count, to say their ABCs, to know their colors, those kinds of things. Supporters of it though do say that it's revenue neutral so why not just move forward with it? Well, there's, a, there's a, a, a financial component to it, but there's also a policy component to it. And let's assume for purposes of argument, it is revenue neutral. However, how many times are we told that about programs and they end up not being revenue neutral? But let's even assume for purposes of argument that it isn't, that it is a revenue neutral. That's not the large question. The larger question is who should be responsible for the education of babies to five-year-olds? And my answer is parents. All right, let's talk a little bit about a large question. Also, uh, one of the large questions that you tend to pose is how active should federal government be in K-12 education and establishing policy? Recently, the governor has asked for a waiver to opt out of no, uh, the federal No Child Left Behind Act, stating that it's another, you have stated, it's another illustration of the ineffectiveness of big government solutions to problems that are best handled by individuals or local governments. It's fair to say that you don't agree with the governor on many policy issues. This is one that you do, but why do you think scrapping it is the best option for Minnesota? Well, first off, I find it ironic that at the same time the governor is acknowledging the failure of many components of No Child Left Behind, he's working hard to get us further into a different federal program. So I would point out that that's a little bit silly. Um, the reason I oppose federal education is because I don't believe that a member of the Congress from uh, Alabama knows anything about what it takes to educate a child in War Road. I don't believe that somebody who was raised in the Bronx, New York, or serves there knows anything about what it takes to, to uh, educate a child in Wyoming. So I believe education is best left at the lowest possible level of government. And yes, I'll say it, I would abolish the Department of Education and I would turn it all back to the states and local governments because I believe that that's where uh, things are best done. And, and I have, look, philosophically I believe that and the track record of the federal government is terrible. They've come out with these programs and even a Democratic governor who basically believes in big government is acknowledging the failure. So let's talk a little bit about things that have been done. As a member of the Senate K-12 Education Committee, you've had a hand in some of the reforms that did pass. What are you most proud of? 
Well, I mean, obviously we would like to have done more, but I think I'm happiest about a couple of the, the provisions that got into the education bill that do things like uh, hopefully drive the cost down and make life easier for local districts. They're going coming back to my uh, philosophy that, that things are best handled locally. The state should not be punishing school boards and ultimately the taxpayer for not meeting contract deadlines. We got the January 15th penalty against districts uh, repealed. Also, the maintenance of effort that required school districts to keep the same level of psychological and medical professionals, regardless of what was going on population-wise or school-wise or revenue-wise in the districts. We've got rid of that. That's a good thing. Um, I'm glad for the alternative teacher licensure. I think that was something good as well. So we made some progress in the right direction, but there's a long way to go. And let's talk about some of the direction to go next session. You were on the program earlier last session talking about your bill that would essentially freeze all school district salaries for two years. It didn't pass. Is that something you're going to pursue next session? Oh, not certainly not in, in January. We don't have a budgeting year. Uh, as far as 2013, who knows what the landscape will look like then. But I'll say again now what I said then. And that is that I would prefer that that type of legislation not be necessary. I would like to get a system where local unions, if there are uh, public unions, are dealing with local boards and that there's not this huge state presence and strength of the union that really kind of uh, puts the boot on the neck of school boards so that they'd have control of their own budget so that I don't have to deal with it. Uh, just like I don't believe that going to Washington makes you smarter, I don't believe that when I got an election certificate to send me to St. Paul that that made me smarter. I still think the people in Roseau and Brainerd and Duluth and Rochester know better what their kids need than I do. Just like I would like to think I know better in Farmington and Lakeville and down the area where I live than somebody who, say, for example, serves for Minneapolis. So I would tend to drive all of this stuff down to the, the local level and let the parents be in charge of their kids' education. So how would you do that, and what kind of policy would you try to focus on next session? Well, I'm a big believer in, for example, right to work. Um, and, and you might say, well, wait a minute, that, that's not specifically directed to education. No, it isn't. But what it would do is it would allow um, it would allow school districts as well as other employers, private and public, to deal with non-union employees to work for them if they wanted to. And it would, it would take a little bit of the power away from the union to drive the agenda in the schools, which they do right now. So that's one thing that I would support is, uh, is that. Also, I would take a lot of laws off the books uh, at the state level that dictate the way local school districts do things. Okay, Senator, we're almost out of time. I do want to ask you a real quick question before we run out of time. We're going to speak with MMB Commissioner James Showalter in just a moment. Minnesota's credit rating, as you know, was just reduced, and a portion of that was uh, attributed to one-time fixes to balance the budget, which includes the K-12 budget shift. How would you value Minnesota's credit rating? Well, I, you know, I, I do think that it, it's legitimate for a, a downgrade. Look, I, I don't have technical expertise in that area, but the fact of the matter is, and I didn't like it, but to some extent, we didn't deal with today's budget problem the way that we should have. We annuitized the roughly $700 million in tobacco funds. We uh, increased the education shift another $700 million. I would have preferred to see all spending, one-time spending, structural spending, stay lower, pay our bills today with today's money and we wouldn't be confronting those kinds of things and it's kind of interesting that 10 years ago and eight years ago and six years ago i was sitting on the radio preaching this stuff and i was regarded as being an outside of the of the norm extremist and now all of the things that i was concerned about are happening our federal government credit rating has been downgraded our state's financial viability has been called into question We've got unsustainable levels of government spending at, in Washington, in Minnesota, and I'm sitting there saying, I was saying this stuff five and six and eight years ago, and all of a sudden it doesn't look so extreme anymore. Okay, Senator Thompson, we're out of time. Unfortunately, we hope to get you back on when session begins, though. Thank you so much Anytime. for joining us. Thank you. Last month, the state of Minnesota found its credit rating reduced, and shortly after, the nation found itself in a similar situation. Right now, to talk about the impacts of those reduction in credit ratings, we have the Commissioner of Minnesota Management and Budget, James Showalter. Thanks so much for joining us today. Thank you. Good to be here. Commissioner, let's begin with, of course, the impacts. What do Minnesotans need to know about the impact of Minnesota's credit rating being reduced to an AA+, according to Fitch? It, that's reduction in our credit rating really means uh, that the grade that our finances and our financial health um, has, has been reduced. It's not a, a question of 
really uh, the rating agencies uh, seeing anything different other than looking at the, the components of our financial health, our economy, our political uh, environment, and saying, well, you're more like some of these other states that have a harder time reacting to uh, extreme circumstances, like other states that maybe need some cash from time to time in order to make your bills. You're more like that. Um, you're not one of the uh, best-run, uh, most solid financial uh, states in the country. And in fact, you said shortly after this happened that this downgrade is a sad statement for those who have worked to deliver quality public services and took our high ratings extremely seriously. The best thing we can do now is resolve the budget debate in a timely fashion and in a manner that addresses our long-term financial stability. Given those words, are you optimistic that this is something that can have in the next that this can happen in the next budget cycle? Actually, I think getting a credit rating improved is something that's going to take many years. Uh, we don't get to this place uh, easily. Uh, it, we got to it from a series of years of where shifts or other type of one-time tools were used to balance the budget, and that we still haven't really resolved our structural problem. So even in the 12-13 biennium in the budget deal that was reached, we balanced the budget, but we used one-time tools, significant ones, that will leave us with another set of difficult questions uh, in the future. Those are the kinds of things that the rating agencies are looking at, and, and we're not going to be able to wipe away quickly. And again, the nation had its credit rating reduced as well. So Minnesotans sitting around the table are going to want to know how does this impact them? Does it even impact them? It certainly does. Uh, the Minnesota credit rating reduction will impact them because a lot of other parts of government get their credit rating based off the states. So school districts, um, higher education institutions, local units of government, all will probably be impacted in some small fashion by the fact that the state isn't going to get the highest rating on its credit. So all of us are going to pay just a little bit more um, in interest costs when we go out to borrow. All of us will have just a little bit difficult, more difficult situation trying to put our credit out in the market. And, and those are the kinds of things that we'll see uh, across the board um, as a result of this downgrade. And you had alluded earlier that it takes a long time for, for states to build back their, their credit rating. Last time, it took 15 years to reestablish our, our credit rating. So what needs to happen, in your opinion, to, for Minnesota to bounce back more quickly this time? I think there's going to be several things that have to happen. Uh, one is uh, just demonstrate that uh, we not only can identify some of our uh, plot problems in the state, uh, but that we can find some political consensus to address them. We've certainly made some progress in some fronts, but there are a lot of issues that we just haven't found a way to have both parties say, yep, this is the strategy that we're going to pursue and continue to pursue those for the years to come. Uh, two is our financial, uh, the state's financials, uh, really just need to improve. We need to remove some of the debt that we have, namely some of the shifts, some of the tobacco securitization that we're starting to do, and, and so that our balance sheet starts to look more like uh, a positive situation where the state's assets are a bit greater than the liabilities that we have. And if, those, those are the kinds of factors they're looking for. And I'm going to interject real quickly. If lawmakers decided to come to you and ask for your, their, your advice to them on the top areas where they really need to seek agreement to try to get this credit rating reestablished, mm -hmm. what would your advice to them be? I think I'd start with structural deficit. I, you know, the key thing that we witnessed all session long was, is this a spending problem? Is this a revenue problem? How can we find some place that everyone can agree to that allows us to resolve the funding interests and needs uh, of the state uh, expenditure side with revenues that we think are sustainable and good for the economy so that the job creators have a stable environment they know what they're going to be facing that the educators out there have a stable environment they know what they're facing we can leverage the efforts of tens of thousands of Minnesotans to do the right thing and get their job done well if we're putting everyone in uncertainty that they're not sure what's going to happen next year, everyone will be in a state of flux, and, and our economy doesn't grow as fast, and frankly, uh, things just don't work as well. And you brought up the economy in a bit earlier. You said most Minnesotans will feel some effect. It might be minimal, but they'll feel some effect from this. How much of an effect? Yeah, you know, truly. Is it quantifiable? It isn't. I, interest rates, as anybody who's watching the markets for the last week knows, interest rates fluctuate wildly. And even when you think they're about to go up, they go down. So I can't tell you that our interest rate costs are going to go up 
because the world's markets may go in a di different direction than we expect. What I can say is that if but for our AAA rating, you know, we would have a slightly better rating or a slightly lower interest cost than we're about to get. You know, and, and it's going to be very small. It's going to be very marginal, but it is still there. When we go to the market, we'll pay just a little bit more. And what's most noticeable is that we'll have a little bit more risk. We'll have a little bit more risk because we don't have the reserves that we need to handle risks out there, and we won't, and we'll need to borrow a little bit more often than we had to um, in decades past. We're almost out of time. Commissioner, you have been a fixture here at the legislature for years as Deputy Commissioner. Now this was your first full session as Commissioner. Give me your thoughts on this new position. Uh, this new position as Commissioner is just a fantastic job. I, it is an amazing place. Uh, what I find most uh, interesting is just the uh, people and the sincere interest in trying to make Minnesota a better place. And it's ugly. It, it is a sausage making factory. It is a place where you don't want to get too close sometimes because there's just people trying to work out agreements. And uh, hopefully we'll find a better way to work out agreements in the future. Okay. So thank you. No, with those words, thank you for joining us. We really appreciate your time, Commissioner. Thank you. History was made many times over in the Minnesota legislature last session. In the House, the first blind speaker pro tem, Tori Westrom. And in the Senate, the first female majority leader, Amy Koch, and president of the Senate. Now, we recently sat down with Senator Michelle Fishbach to get her impression on making history. Senator Fishbach, thanks for joining us. Thank you very much for having me. You were the first female president of the Minnesota Senate. Encapsulate for us your first legislative session in this capacity. Well, it was very exciting. Um, obviously, you know, not just um, as the first female president, but just in general taking over the, um, overseeing the body as we run our days. Um, it, there's a lot to learn and um, it's, it's a little nerve wracking when all eyes are on you and you're trying to make decisions um, on various, uh, you know, procedural things that are going on and there's a lot to learn. Although I was fairly familiar with the rules, there's a lot to learn still uh, when you're actually having to apply them. Is it what you expected? For the most part, yes. Um, I think a little, probably more nerve wracking than I thought it would be. Let's talk about any hiccups. Were there any moments where you thought, hmm, I wasn't expecting that? There sure were. There. <laughs> Would you like to go into detail? <laughs> there sure were. Well, you know, as I, uh, there was, I think, one of the very first days we forgot to vote on something, and that was probably my fault, I think, uh, a recess or some, something very simple, um, you know, not, not causing any bill to be uh, misprocessed or anything like that, but simply, you know, some, some little things like that. But we always were able to go back and fix it and make the procedures, uh, follow all the procedures correctly. When Senator Metzen held the post, we spoke with him a couple of years ago, and he said to hi for him, one of the greatest challenges was remaining bipartisan or nonpartisan, whichever term you choose to use. Was this a, a significant challenge for you as well? I think we were able to accomplish that. I think, you know, obviously there are some political decisions that have to be made, but I think for the most part, making sure that everybody gets to uh, have their time on the floor and speak when they want to and make the, um, make the uh, points that they would like to. I think we were able to handle that. We did things a little bit differently instead of, uh, I know that Senator Metzen would uh, go pro-con, pro-con and have, but we, we tried to keep people in order um, as they had asked to speak and made sure that everybody got the opportunity. So Madam President, finally, any changes that you plan to make in 2012 or improvements? Well, I think it'll just be improved. I, I know the system much better and understand uh, much better what's going on. I think things will go very smoothly. Are you looking forward to it? Absolutely. Senator Fishbach, thank you so much for your time today. Thank you. In today's program, we profile two former governors, each making history for different reasons. The first, Newt Nelson. He was known as the grand old man of politics, a man whose lifelong career in public service would endear him to thousands of people throughout Minnesota. His statue rests prominently in front of the state capitol, a tribute to his accomplishments to state and country. Knut Nelson was a Norwegian immigrant who came to America with his mother when he was six years old. 
They settled in Wisconsin, where Nelson was determined as a young man to seek out an education. The story his biographer tells is that he lived near uh, an Albion Academy in Wisconsin, and he knocked on the door of the president and said, how can I go to school even though I don't have money to go to school? And the president was impressed and provided him with a free education for many years. In turn, he provided services to the school, like carrying wood, et cetera, like that. Nelson took a job as a country school teacher and later volunteered to join the Wisconsin 4th Regiment. He was wounded and taken prisoner during the Civil War. Upon returning home, he finished school, became a lawyer, and later served in the Wisconsin State Assembly. Shortly thereafter, Nelson moved his wife and child west to a farm in Alexandria, Minnesota, where his love of politics and public service began to fully emerge. He almost immediately became the Douglas County attorney, so again he entered public service as well as uh, um, working his farm. Uh, it, it was probably the basis for his long-term interest in the uh, needs of farmers as well as labor. So throughout his career, he was championing the causes of the farmers um, and the laborers, trying to get um, um, uh, protection for the farmers for their prices. So he did work with, uh, as governor of the state of Minnesota, to regulate grain and railroad industries. Another thing that he's known for is that in 1894, the Hinckley fire was uh, quite a disaster in Minnesota, killing you know the 400 or so people. And he was able to uh, spearhead the relief efforts that went to the survivors of that fire. Uh, he was also very interested in public lands. Um, it really was the start of his interest in uh, um, acquiring public land for uh, state parks, which he continued in the U.S. Senate, um, but buying land for Itasca State Park was one of his accomplishments as governor. Nelson's list of accomplishments were plenty and led to the honor that was ultimately bestowed on him. The main statue uh, is of him, um, obviously, as, as serving as governor and U.S. Senator for those many years. Then there are side assemblages, uh, one including his mother and him. Um, his mother is wrapped in a shawl, uh, and he's a little boy, uh, indicating his roots as uh, a poor immigrant and rising to great political stature. And then the other is of him as a soldier. As United States Senator, Nelson was noted for his work on bankruptcy law. As governor, he's remembered fondly for his contributions to the completion of the current state capitol building. His distinguished service as a state senator, congressman, governor, and U.S. senator endeared him to the citizens of the state. At that period of time, he had completed his service to the United States, to Minnesota, and was the longest serving United States Senator from Minnesota. He served for 28 years, and that record of service has not been exceeded as yet. At that time, there was a groundswell of support to remember him. So not only did he have a portrait, the bust in the Senate, but there were contributions from all over the state to build a statue in his memory. The likeness of Knut Nelson stands tall, overlooking the Capitol grounds a statue that symbolizes his life and his work. John Johnson was born in St. Peter, Minnesota in 1861. The son of Swedish immigrants, he would grow up to become one of the state's most loved and respected governors. And because of his place and time in history, he would become known as a governor of firsts. He was the first native-born Minnesotan, Minnesotan to serve as a governor. He was the first to actually occupy a full term of office in the brand new capital after it opened in 1905. So he was elected in 1904, was um, inaugurated into the position in, in January of 1905 and served all the way until his death in 1909 in the state capital. He was also the first to um, actually pass away as a governor in office in Minnesota history and then the first to have a memorial dedicated on the brand new Capitol Mall. The statue is not only a tribute to Governor Johnson's character and accomplishments, but it's also a symbol of the state's economy during the time in which he lived. The idea of the, the other statues is to kind of incorporate what Minnesota 
was about in 1905 or when the building opened um, also what Minnesota's industry was like. So it really uh, focuses on farming. So one of the figures is a farmer, another one is a miner, uh, another one is a lumber cruiser which represents the, the lumbering industry and also the manufacturing. So they are all representation of, of what Minnesota's industry was like at that time and the importance of the economy and how we were becoming a very prosperous state at that time. Johnson's rise to prominence in Minnesota was in large part due to a respect for his humble beginnings. His mom was a washerwoman, his dad was a blacksmith. There was a, some alcohol problems with the father and he eventually left the family and deserted uh, John and his brothers and sisters. And so as a 13 year old, he had to uh, start working in a store to provide income for the family. He developed a reputation in the community as a hardworking, likable man. After serving in the National Guard, he returned home and became co-owner and editor of the St. Peter Herald newspaper. A Republican at heart, his new venture soon offered him a different political perspective. And that was a, a Democratic paper. And so I think because of uh, being affiliated with that paper, he uh, kind of looked more at the Democratic perspective and became more of a Democrat at that time. Johnson liked politics, and after a few failed attempts, was elected to the state Senate. As a Democrat from St. Peter, he won in an overwhelmingly Republican district. Although he failed to win re-election, he'd proven he could win in a Republican district, a fact not lost on party leaders. People started kind of throwing his name in there as a potential governor's candidate, and so he um, reluctantly, in a sense, um, was kind of drafted by the party to run as governor. And so he ran in the 1904 election, was elected surprisingly once again as the governor of Minnesota. You have to remember at that time, uh, Minnesota was still a pretty strong Republican state. And so when um, John Johnson was running for the Minnesota governor's seat, he was basically the only one from the Democratic Party elected to uh, official's office. And so he really, uh, was kind of a, a shining light for the Democratic Party at that time. And politically, he was seen as a, a real moderate, so he was able to work with both the Republicans and the Democrats as a governor of Minnesota. Johnson came into office without a strong political agenda, but his gifted ability to reason with lawmakers opened the door to many reforms, including a reduction in passenger rail rates and changes in state insurance and tax codes, much of which benefited state citizens. At 48 years old, John Johnson died of complications after stomach surgery, the first Minnesota governor to die in office. Over 50,000 people came to pay their respects as he lay in state at the Capitol. Through all of his many accomplishments, fairness and character became noticeable attributes for John Johnson. His reputation as an honorable man helped secure both his political stature and his place in history. That wraps up this week's Capitol Report. From all of us at Senate Media Services, I'm Julie Bartke. Thank you for watching. Mm -hmm.